Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click, get flexible payment options, then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. It's hard to believe that we've been having in-depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. So many great conversations over the years about so many great movies. All that said, producing this show week after week requires a ton of work behind the scenes. Becoming a Next Real member gives you access to all sorts of additional and exclusive content. Plus, you're helping us keep the lights on. Just head to the nextreel.com slash membership, where you can learn more about becoming a member, which costs a measly $5 a month, practically the same as one fancy coffee drink. And you get so much more. Every month, we record a bonus episode exclusively for members. Those episodes cover movies from whatever series we're covering at the moment or add to previous series. Some movies we've covered that only members get to hear us discuss include The Blues Brothers, The Russia House, Naked Lunch, Independence Day, The Hot Rock, and Relic, the better one. Plus, members get to vote on what we're going to discuss for those episodes. We also record additional pre- and post-show content in regular episodes that only members get to hear. Like conversations about similarly themed movies. And answering listener questions from our live member chat. Speaking of our live member chat, we record almost all of our episodes in Discord, where members can chat right along with us live. Members get access to other members-only channels in our Discord community as well. On top of all that, members get all episodes a full week earlier than everyone else in a private Next Reel feed just for them that includes all the shows in the Next Reel family. The Next Reel, the film board, movies we like, sitting in the dark, and more new projects on the way. To top it all off, members don't have to listen to ads. We've already eliminated those annoying, dynamically inserted ads that, let's face it, we all hate it. We are listening to you. We love podcasting for a living, and those ads help to pay the bills. Now, we're counting on you, dear listener. We promise we aren't going back to those terrible, dynamically inserted ads that don't relate to us at all. All we ask is that you consider supporting the Next Real family of podcasts with a membership. Again, it's $5 per month or $55 per year. Just head to thenextreel.com slash membership. Thenextreel.com slash membership. Get your access to early, ad-free episodes with bonus content, member bonus episodes, and access to member channels and live streams in Discord by signing up today. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Andy Nelson. Welcome to the next reel when the movie ends... Our conversation begins. The best years of our lives is over. How many times have I told you I hated you and believed it in my heart? These are the great personalities who bring a memorable experience to glowing life. Samuel Goldwyn's masterpiece. 
The screenplay was written by Robert E. Sherwood, Pulitzer Prize winning playwright of Petrified Forest and Idiot's Delight. From this, William Wyler, who won the Academy Award for his direction of Mrs. Miniver, wove a pattern of motion picture magic with Myrna Loy and Frederick March living through the heartwarming second bloom of love. Dana Andrews and Teresa Wright feeling the breathtaking thrill of love at first sight. Hoagie Carmichael spreading his own brand of stardust. All of them together giving all of us the best years of our lives. Best years of our lives, Andy. That's the movie we're talking about today. It's part of our, uh, you know, fancy uh, award season uh, shenanigans that we're doing this year. 1947 Academy Award nominees for Best Writing Screenplay. That is the series we are currently doing, and this is the second of that series. And this this one won. This one won. Yeah, this was the big dog in the in the field. Yes, you could say that. Pretty good. Pretty, pretty good. You had seen this movie before. I think I'd seen it before, but I didn't remember it being three hours of this movie. Uh, so watched it again, and it felt like a new film to me in many areas. How did it hit you this watch? I uh, really pretty much loved everything about it. It was, um, I, I had seen this before. I think I watched this in in college and then probably rented it um, sometime after that. And I've always enjoyed the film. I, I think that it's a it's a really interesting look at kind of life for veterans post World War II. But what struck me the most on this most recent watch was just you know exactly how William Wyler was constructing the frame and using the camera paired with Greg Toland, his cinematographer, and. Uh, it just it made it even better for me because I always remembered it being, oh, it's a very much a character piece of people, you know, figure out how to live again in this in this uh, period. But I guess I had just taken for granted exactly how much cinematic storytelling uh, that William Wyler was really infusing throughout it. Yeah, I I think <laughs> it's just effortless filmmaking is what this what this feels like to me. Like this is a this is a complicated emotional narrative. Uh the the story of bringing these three vets home from the war and having to follow each of them in their reintegration struggles with society. The way it plays out on film is so fluid to me that that we move back and forth between their stories and how the stories intertwine and how the characters intertwine, how they meet one another early on and develop relationships that last through the entirety of the film. It is just seamless to me. I didn't have a single a single instance when I was thinking, God, I wish we could get back to that character. I wish we could get back to that relationship. I'm I'm bored with this one. Can we move on? I just, I was in it the entire duration of the film. It doesn't feel at all like it's a three-hour movie, because it's not. It's like 240 something, right? Uh, but close enough. And uh, and it just, it just blew by in a, in a breath. It, this is, this was a terrific, terrific watch for me. And notable, because I, the thing I remember about seeing the movie is, oh, there was that kind of tasteless thing where they put that guy in in hooks for hands and it didn't look very real. And I'm embarrassed to say that I am so, so deeply wrong. <laughs> about that. My memory is very wrong. He was not an actor. He was a vet who lost his hands. He was teaching demolition during the war and a faulty fuse on some TNT that he was handling actually blew his hands off. Uh, this is Harold Russell. And so not only did he become the first non-professional actor to win uh, an Academy Award for acting as, as supporting actor, he also won the honorary award in the same Oscar. So I think he was the first to win two Oscars for the same performance and the first recipient to sell his award, uh, which is interesting, too. So Harold Russell is... It, to me, after all of is said and done, is is one of the top reasons to watch this movie. I thought his performance was fantastic and interesting and compelling. And, you know, I, I start with a picture of how this movie is going to take shape and end up at his wedding was an awesome surprise 
to me. So I, I could not gush more about Harold Russell in this movie. He was just fantastic. He was a wonderful find uh, that uh, Weiler had uh, seen in one of the little war shorts that were uh, playing at the time. And uh, it was called Diary of a Sergeant from 1945, kind of this uh, documentary behind the scenes story about uh, this person who had lost his hands and and just kind of like everything that they were doing to kind of rehabilitate him and how he was learning to use his hooks and all that sort of stuff. Really, I, I didn't have a chance to watch it, but honestly, you can go to Harold Russell's Wikipedia page and they have the entire 24-minute uh, short there that you can watch. It's uh, it's pretty interesting. We'll put uh, the link in the show notes for that. The part in the original uh, book was originally just somebody suffering PTSD. And after Weiler saw this uh, short with Russell, he changed the or had the script changed because he felt that would be a more interesting part and and, uh, cast Russell in it. And such an incredibly powerful performance. You're right about the two Oscars. And yeah, the fact that he sold it, um, it, you know, he said at the time it was for medical expenses for his wife. This was in the 90s, much later in his life. Although I guess that had been disputed too. Who really knows? It ended up, um, Lou Wasserman was the person who bought it, ended up donating it back to the Academy. But anyway, yeah, Harold Russell, his part of the story is such a fascinating one. And to have a non-actor come in to this big film with a big director and deliver such an uh, underspoken, heartbreaking, uh, powerful performance. It, it's just, it's a real surprise and absolutely like the heart of the film. Just, I mean, every bit he has, like when he brings Wilma up to his room, because, oh. you know, over the course of the story, he's, <laughs> it's like he's gotten used to his hooks for hands, but he has closed himself off to believing that anyone else in his life will be able to understand. And so he's closing out Wilma, the woman who loves him. He's closing out his family and everyone's kind of getting used to it, but he just can't get used to them getting used to it. And it's, it's he just doesn't believe that they would. Like, why would they love me with this? And so that scene just broke my heart when he brings her up to to say this is what life with me is like and to see how he has to go to bed and how he has to take his hooks off and everything and the way that that is the big moment the transition that he needed to have her acknowledge you know i i will do this i'm happy to help you i i'm I care about you. I love you. I mean, it's just, it was amazing. Just what a scene. And then that last shot of his face as he's just laying in bed in the shadows and you just see tears running down his cheeks. It just, I mean, ugh, amazing. It's extraordinary. And look at the choice there because we have that scene essentially mirrored an hour and a half earlier in the film when he goes to bed and his dad is helping him do all that. We don't see his hooks on the bed. We don't see the partial arms that that he's living with. They don't show that. That's an enormous amount of just sort of in building that sense of anticipation of how are other people could, going to adjust now that we see that dad has. And I, I think it was just a really special choice in filmmaking that, that Weiler made to do the big reveal when it was most emotionally resonant. And I, I didn't see it coming when, when he called her up to the bedroom, I didn't see that coming. And uh, that, that was a, that was a choker for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, talking about, I guess, each of our three stories, since we started talking about him, let's just focus on Homer and kind of his his journey. Uh, it's an interesting set of, like, moments that we have in his story. He's very open and friendly and warm with these two, you know, new friends of his. You know, he only has just met Fred and Al as they are at the airport uh, finally getting a flight back home right they it's it's this final moment that they uh or this one moment they come together on the plane to boone city it's a long flight because uh, the plane has to make a lot of stops but and so they have a lot of time to get to know each other these two guys you know they're soldiers they've already seen a lot of stuff so getting used to his hooks is very easy they kind of become fast friends and then they return to their lives and he's the first one who gets dropped off 
immediately like his family comes out and greets him and everyone is thrilled and then you have that moment where he as the as his two other uh, veteran friends are driving off in the cab he raises his hand to wave at them and you just see everybody's eyes his mom his dad his little sister and Wilma all of their eyes go to that hook and they just stare at it because they've kind of shot it in a way where everyone's focused on him no one's really focused on the hands again going back to how the the camera work is constructed. It's not focused on those, you know? So powerful moment. And then you kind of are introduced with how that works in his life. And the only person who really seems to uh, kind of have a little more understanding in his in his family circle is his uncle, Butch, who runs kind of the bar. And we kind of see him returning there time and again. Uh, just how does that whole structure play for you as far as the way that he's integrated into his life and his journey? It's funny. I it, it worked really well for me, but I can't help but think about, you know, movies that are made about vets with amputations, you know, war related amputations decade after decade after decade. Right. Like we we jump to Forrest Gump. We jump to these other movies where they're told with so much more kind of grit. And in this movie, the sensibility of the 40s, the grit is what is unstated, right? The the rage is unstated. And yet I I feel like the performance is there, right? I feel like the fear of the unknown is there. I felt like like watching them look at the hooks and and see it just sort of the, the hooks sort of terrorize them because they don't know what to do when mom starts crying and says, oh, I'm just so excited to see you, you know, but I'm also terrified of the unknown. I, you know, I'm looking around a corner of, of what I can't anticipate in, in your life and what's what's in it for us, your parents, your friends, your siblings. That's so scary. And, and so this movie is presented with sort of that sweetness of the 40s. But it's not like they're hiding from the story itself. It's not like they're hiding from telling a hard tale. And and that's the thing that really stuck out to me. They didn't have to have a lot of screaming and yelling for it to still be a hard story to watch. Yeah, we didn't need him running around the house screaming penis at his mom like we'll get a few years later with Tom Cruise. No. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're absolutely yeah. right. We didn't need need the but and and it is of note that here we are watching this movie with an actual amputee, right? Like not watching you know non amputeed performers yeah and which you know i suppose is inevitably going to be a challenge it's it's interesting i i feel like there's an interesting shift in expectations from some of the audience in today's film going where if you're not that person you don't get to play that person you know or or that that person not being a you know bio, biopic type of word but just like if you don't fit it then you can't do it and it's you're not giving that person the opportunity and it's a really tricky line in the world of acting and i totally appreciate that perspective and i understand you know give that opportunity to those people um i just also acknowledge that in the scope of making films in this particular case about an amputee that finding the right amputee to play the role is a challenge. And I don't think without having been featured in that war short that William Wyler would have necessarily, um, well, he might not even even had the yeah. idea, uh, let alone if he had, like, what's the search for that and, and trying to find that sort of person. And so it's an, it's a tricky... Uh, it's a tricky line. And I just think in the world, the nature of acting is playing something that you're not. And I think, yeah, there's a line where it, it works. And, you know, in Forrest Gump is a great example. I mean, Gary Sinise, I think, worked exceptionally well as, uh, as Lieutenant Dan. And could they have found somebody who had lost his legs? Absolutely. But also, Gary Sinise is a pretty fantastic actor. And having him yeah. play that part, you know, worked really well. And I, I really enjoy seeing him in that. So it's a tricky, it's a tricky it's line, a tricky. but I, I just love what, uh, I love what they do with this character here and, and giving Harold the opportunity to play the part. It worked well in context of this particular story. 
it's so funny. I mean, uh, this season in in uh, Only Murders in the Building, Meryl Streep is playing an actress who has trouble getting work. She should not get that role. She, what does she know about not getting work? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> she's never been a nanny. She's never been. She's never been an out of work actress nanny. <laughs> Uh, oh, gosh. Well, anyway, so that that there's got to be somebody out there who can really turn into a cobra. That person should be cobra. <laughs> <laughs> what a tangent we're on. That's so good. You're right, Andy. <laughs> Paul Rudd should not play cobra. Um, I I also I also think that piece about Harold Russell. Like, had he not been in that movie, would he even have thought about? saying yes to a role like this, let alone would Weiler have ever known his name. Like, I, yeah, I don't yeah. I don't know about uh, about Russell. <laughs> is it, would, was he trying to become an actor? Uh, my sense is the answer is probably not. I, I didn't think so. I mean, he was, you know, he, he was in that war short. And then, uh, I, you know, I don't know, from all I could tell that Weiler saw that and then reached out. I mean, the war short came out in 45. This came out in 46. So it's not like he had years to be, you know, pursuing the acting button right. or anything like that. It was like literally like the very next. He was discovered uh, yeah, with this right. movie. Is the thing. Yeah. Maybe that's that's what gave him the bug to try other stuff later. But yeah. Um, and he would go on to be like he was cast in a few other films like Inside Moves in 1980, uh, uh, Dogtown in 97, plus some uh, TV episodes in Trapper John MD in China Beach. So he acted a few other times, but largely like after this, uh, I think it was was it Weiler who uh, urged him to go uh, back to school. Yeah. And so he did. And he ended up. Uh, becoming very involved with vets, very involved uh, with uh, people who had uh, lost limbs and other things from their time in the service. He um, was a part of AMVETS for quite a long time. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that he ended up kind of devoting his career to uh, to all of that, which is uh, pretty impressive. Yeah, for sure. Now, as far as um, the the other characters in our story, who do you want to? Who should we talk about? I feel like we should start with Frederick March because Frederick March, as uh, Al Stevenson, well, he's certainly the oldest, <laughs> if if not senior, in um, I you know, because and and I think that brings about no question of of rank. Uh, am I able to answer right? But like, I don't under. The, I don't understand kind of their relative rank to each other and who's saluting one another. And most of it is because I think the ideology of the movie is to ask the question, what are heroes anyway? Right. Like these guys come home and all they talk about is I didn't see the things you thought I saw. Like I dropped the bombs on the things like that's all I did. And and so the the acts of heroism have to be told through other people's reactions to what these guys are talking about. And and so Frederick March comes home to his family and is trying to reintegrate with Myrna Loy and, uh, you know, his daughter, Peggy, Teresa Wright. <laughs> and his giant of a son who clearly is still in grade school. I'm not exactly yeah, sure. Right. He's a sixth grader, but he's six <laughs> Go do your homework. And, yeah. <laughs> right. Right. You don't get to come out with the grownups, even though you're bigger than everyone here. Right. <laughs> Right. That was uh, Rob, uh, Rob, uh, played by Michael Hall. And and, you know, that whole family relationship, I thought, was so interesting. But it it the joy in that family relationship is uh, a mask to dad's serious PTSD, I have to imagine, related alcoholism. Like he just can't stop the drink. And uh, I, I think March is this character was wholly believable to me. It's a really interesting uh, journey, and it, it's interesting because the way that it was described in Weiler's decision to change from the story, removing a character suffering from PTSD to bring in Harold Russell to play Homer, I'm like, all of these characters are suffering from PTSD in one way or another. And so I'm curious, like, what was that character's story like? Because everyone else is certainly dealing with their own issues here. And it's fascinating to see this 
senior level banker who goes into the army. He's much older than his uh, these other two characters. He ends up becoming a sergeant. And, you know, we'll talk about Fred here in a little bit. Fred becomes a captain, which is ranked much higher than a sergeant, yet he's much younger. He's the age of Al's daughter. And so it's interesting. Like, this is an example of the older man who decides to enlist and ends up becoming kind of a, a technical sergeant. And uh, even though this other person in town is his senior who ends up you know, in the work world is at a much lower level than him. And so it's that whole disparity of kind of like the way that all of that shifts and everything. But yeah, so he went to the military as this banker. He's older, and now he is trying to reintegrate into his life as this banking man, but also trying to figure out how do how do I fit into this family anymore? And my kids are so grown up, and my son is talking about you know, the devastation of what the atom bomb did and right. the realities of kind of like how the Japanese people treat their their family and, and the the way that like when he gives his son the, the samurai sword, it, it's like it was such an interesting and immediate picture of generations because you have oh. this older person who's like, yeah, look at the stuff I've got off of this dead guy. Here's his sword. Here's this uh, scarf that he had that had you know messages from all of his family. And his son's response, I mean, yes, he says thanks, but he's just like, well, you know, they they really view that in their culture that it's a much more important the way that family is treated and everything. And it's like this was his dad's enemy, but here he is like it's that understanding of it. And it's just I found that to be such right out of the gate, like an eye opening conversation that puts him into this place like, wait a minute, this is my family, but they're not acting the way that I was expecting. And I think a lot of that also pushed to that that heavy drinking problem that he has, part of that whole PTSD of suffering, like you haven't seen the things I've seen sort of thing, you know? Absolutely. And and what's so interesting about him being older, they make a point of saying, you know, I, you know, I'm, I'm going back to see my wife and family. I've been married 20 years before I went in. And, and meanwhile, uh, Fred is saying, you know, I had, what did I have some months before I was I, I left, right, in my marriage. And so, like, that whole experience of, of coming home to the different kind of ideological shift between these two, quote, families, that scene with his son really stood out to me, too, because going to those links in that little tiny scene to show just how far home has progressed while you were away. Time, like you were fighting, you were doing the activities of war, but time, really cultural time, stood still. And here we have, at home, cultural time moved in fast forward because they are watching the war from a distance. And their emotion, their thinking about the war and what it means and the damage done is is changing in real time. Meanwhile, these guys are looking at war as if under a microscope when they're doing it from the belly of a plane. You know, they're too in it to see what it's doing. And I think that the movie shines such a bright light on on that aspect of it. And and then obviously later, and we'll talk about Fred, but later when we have the the showdown at the at the soda stream <laughs> by the soda bar is another interesting one, right? Where we have yet another, like we start with his son and we go to somebody else who's, who's an adult and not in favor of the war for a very different reason. Yeah, right. Which I think was, was you know, essentially we meet our conspiracy theorist, we'll say, you know, who, who would today be considered a conspiracy theorist. You've got to read the headlines, read the real news, right? So, I think that's fascinating. And that's something that that I, I think going into this movie again, I did not expect to see the movie take such time to watch these other characters who revolve, who are in orbit around our principal trio, actually live in sort of counter to their experience of heroism. And I, I thought that was fascinating. Yeah, it absolutely is. It really gives us this sense of reintegration that, mm -hmm. you know, not only for our three soldiers here as they're trying to fit into what society is like now and how things have shifted while they've been away, while they've been in the military machine, which, you know, I mean, sure, they have the Stars and Stripes news to kind of read and kind of keep up with things going on in the world. But at the same time, there's a lot of change happening that they're not necessarily seeing. And these are those things that that they're uh, bumping into. But also 
society is bumping into because society is growing and changing too. And that person at the the soda shop is one of those people who's just like, everybody is going to be starting to kind of deal with that sort of person as they start uh, kind of moving through life and kind of bumping into that person who may or may not strike up a conversation with you about their perspective on things. Yeah, for sure. So March uh, and Frederick March, are, his work at the bank, I think there was one other angle that I think is important to look at, which was his efforts to give the under appreciated veterans opportunities, right? And we have this wonderful scene where he is faced with that challenge of giving a loan to this other uh, veteran who just wants a farm. And he says, look, I don't have any collateral. I know you want collateral. I don't have collateral because I don't have anything. That's why I need the loan so I can have a thing to start growing this farm, which which shows just the lunacy of our uh, of of some of the conversations that we're required to have because of the rules and uh, of of actually managing a a big financial institution it it makes it sound ridiculous and i i certainly understand the reasons for things like collateral but uh this in this sequence uh, I think we get and then the, the setup to the punchline, which is his his semi drunken speech talking about how we are gambling with the future. Right. We're we're <laughs> we're doing so in a way that is, uh, you know, we're we're gambling on the future of our of our lives on the backs of our veterans. And uh, I thought that was just a really special thing for this guy, even in a compromised semi drunken state. I think it is. It it is really smart for the movie to put those words in his mouth in front of those privileged in the audience of wealth, right? Like that, that was a really special sequence. And it was heartbreaking and comedic and just complicated, but very human. It's an interesting scene. And I guess that was one story thread that I, I wasn't sure if I... I I felt like I was expecting more from that story thread following his decision to grant that that loan to the to the vet, uh, which, you know, just as a side note, interesting comparison with uh, It's a Wonderful Life, which also comes out the same year, because that's another story dealing with bankers who help these people who need it. And then the Mr. Potters of the world who think that banks are are not working because they're doing things like that. You know, he fits very much Mr. Milton's kind of shoes. But did you feel satisfied that the speech that he gives, the drunken speech he gives at that, at that banker's meeting, uh, Mr. Milton kind of seems like it, it, it in very much a way, it's kind of a dig at everything Mr. Milton told him that you can't do and in, in, in that whole conversation that they had, only to have, like, after the whole speech, his wife tells him later, she's like, I, you know, I, I, I think Mr. Mil- Milton liked what you had to say. And, and that's the last we hear of it. From that point forward, the story of Al really focuses on trying to figure out the relationship between his daughter and Fred. And we lose that entire banking thread. And do you feel like that was warranted? Do you feel like that conversation was what that story thread needed to kind of come to a conclusion? For me, it was, I think, for economy of narrative, right? Like there was a lot going on in this movie and any more time spent talking about banking infrastructure is time lost on these other two characters who are dealing with meaningful story points, too. But for me, it was not an optimistic thread, right? This banking thing was not optimistic. I was left with that thread uh, after the conversation where Milton sort of gives him a talking to, you know, yes, we'll be more concerned about collateral in the future. Well, we of course this one is approved but future when when scowly Mc, mcscowlface storms off uh the guy who actually tattled on yeah, stevenson right um right he uh, i think he's the guy who wins like we know with the gift of history he's the guy who wins right uh, you know to me it was just like he tried stevenson tried to do a thing and the slice of life that we get the slice of experience that we get it, it is a really sort of special opportunity for him to contribute and we get to know 
that it doesn't end up paying off for him any more than it pays off for the guys who come home and have to go work and be soda jerks or, you know, what have you, like, or live off the dole. I mean, like the next time we see um, Harold Russell's uh, character, he's talking about how he's just depositing money from the from his the government because of his amputation. Like, None of those are good, even though they're presented here with a smile and a laugh. Yeah, it's an interesting story thread that I guess I could have used a little bit more there, even just a hint that as optimistic as it felt, as things felt for him after his speech, like, yeah, I really told it to him. And yeah, I'm going to go down this road. I just would have loved to know, like, does that mean he does get to give more grants now or or, or loans or is, is his boss going to actually come down on him and, and keep him uh, his leash uh, tightened up. So, yeah. And, and I think it's the latter. I think it's the latter to me. That's I walked out feeling really glum for that chum. Yeah, I will just say it's just <laughs> another funny reference to It's a Wonderful Life. But that character that you said, Mr. Scowly Face, who comes in yeah. and is just he also is the bank examiner in It's a Wonderful <laughs> Life. Like what a weird <laughs> Like a recurring thing for 1946. Like you need to be in more banking roles. Oh my gosh, was he in one? Of, was he one of the old men around the Dick Van Dyke's table and singing the Tuppence song? Like, he's a banker in all of the period banking pieces. Yeah, right. No kidding. Yeah, that's so uh, Charles Halton who played that part. Very funny. Very funny. Okay, let's talk about Fred. Fred comes back. Bearing the look of the most privileged, right, of of the group. He is a strapping young white man who can wear a uniform and a suit and look great in either. And he comes home to this gorgeous, energetic, blonde young wife and can't find her at first because she's off working the club scene. (laughs) That's the first uh, real sign that things are not going to go well for privilege. From there, it's just all downhill because the guy can't get work. And he's the one who's like, look at the cultural contrast that by all rights, I should be able to find stable work in our economy. And I cannot. And we're forced to ask, is it strictly because of veteran status? Is it strictly because of how vets are looked at by the community, lauded as heroes, but in name and picture only? Like when it comes down to putting them to work, have we been dealing with the same thing for every war for which we send our our young? Right. Like he is the picture of that for me. And well, and also Dana Andrews. I mean, yeah, and he is uh, a handsome man. And I mean, he's got the perfect, you know, beautiful bombshell of a wife and everything. When he comes home the first time, he goes back to his dad's place and it is a rundown, beaten up old place. And you realize he's grown up on the other side of the tracks from these other two, essentially. It's not it's not the suburbs. It's not the fancy apartment. It is kind of the slum part of town. And his dad, which did you recognize his dad at all? Roman Bonin. He was just in Of Mice and Men. He played Candy, the man with the dog. That's right. That's right. Yeah. The man totally the dog, recognized yeah. his voice. That's where that's what gave it away. Nice. Anyway, he was not an educated person. His job before he left was as a soda jerk at this drugstore. And so he went to the military and it's, it's kind of, I don't know, it's an interesting, like, at what point did did that expectation of when you join the military, they're going to give you the training that you need to get into the workforce when you get out. Because that certainly isn't the case here. He was a bomber. He had no skills that he got from that. And society views him as he's going and talking to people like everyone's like, you don't have the skills that you need in order to do a job here. So he ends up exactly back where he started at this drugstore, which, of course, now has been taken over. This is a whole other side of the story of like corporate takeovers, right? Like that's Mr. Potter who came in and converted this old you know, drugstore and soda shop that he had worked at. Now it's this corporate place where his assistant is now his boss and everything is so uh, kind of regimented 
and the way you have to memorize the names of all the perfumes and the right way to say it and everything. It's like, it's, it's really funny to see, but it's like, this is where he was left. Like he, he wasn't given any other opportunities after his time. And so as much as you kind of expect that this is a person who should have the opportunities, he just doesn't get them. And uh, it made for an interesting twist in expectations with that character. Yeah, I, I think so too. And man, do they lean in on it, right? Like keep the, when when he's having that conversation with the manager, you know, looking over the bustling store. Like the shot itself seems to indicate there is no world in which this guy doesn't need a job helping to manage this store. There is a lot of opportunity down there. It is bursting at the rafters with customers. Like, just this guy needs a job down there. And the the manager keeps saying, look, surely, as a captain, surely you are a leader of men. No, I was the guy who put the bombs on the thing, right? That was, that was, my, I was what I was trained to do, right? To your point about the promises of the military giving the education you need to succeed in the world after, this movie points hard that that is not the case for the vast majority of the people who come out of of the the war. So f- there, the movie seems diabolically progressive, <laughs> right? To some views, right? To uh, it really, it's it's an advocacy film, I think, for a lot of the the movie. And and part of the frustration with what's his name, the band Milton, is like we're hiring you. Because of the flood of GI Bill requests, right? We need to handle those. We don't know how to handle those. And handle is not delivered in a, an optimistic way. It is, uh, no, we, we don't yeah. know how to constrain them or meter them or uh, manage them. So, yeah, stark. It is a lot more of a stark depiction of this world, as hopeful as the story is, as romantic and, and, and as beautiful it is as you find the connections with each of these characters and how they journey There are so many dark elements within it as well that really kind of depict that post-war America that that I I think Weiler certainly was seeing the various people involved in the the original uh, content and the screenplay saw. And I just felt like it, it just probably one of the reasons it succeeded so well is because it really nailed the zeitgeist of the times of all of these things that everybody was taking in, whether you were a veteran or not, just everything that you were seeing as all these veterans were coming home and the war ended. Yeah. Uh, also, this is a, one of those hit Hoagie Carmichael vehicles. Oh, yes. Fun to see Hoagie at the piano. Absolutely. He was uh, just a fun in that little role of Butch, uh, you know, Homer's uncle, and not a lot of scenes, but some great moments that he had, and just the way that he would talk with um, with Homer, and uh, just, I mean, some just great moments. Just, uh, he was fun. A lot of fun. He's <laughs> really fun, and plays a mean chopsticks. <laughs> yes. I mean, really mean <laughs> chopsticks. <laughs> Absolutely. That was great. Oh, we haven't really talked much about the women in the film. Where Myrna Loy plays Al's wife, and uh, you know she is uh, the one who is trying to figure out how to deal with this husband. Who I, again, we don't know exactly how much of a drinker he was beforehand, but uh, he certainly is uh, a drinker now. And right out of the gate, you know, he takes him out, and it is a night of just drunken craziness as they go from club to club and he is a little bit worse for the wear but Myrna Loy is the one who's really trying to figure out how to deal with this and you know I mean we just you know had our last season we had our Thin Man series which was so great to kind of go through all of those and watch those and we learned as we were talking about that that the only reason she came back to do one of those uh, films that that took place during World War II was because of the kind of that that group of people. But otherwise, you know, she was very involved in the support of the war and everything during the time that the war was going on. And so I found it so perfectly fitting that she was in this film and as somebody who was here kind of supporting her husband veteran. And and she's great. It is not a huge role. Um, and I, you know, I, I mean, it's of the of the three uh, women, principal women, you know, each to match their vet. Uh, hers is is sort of the most 
the most predictable, I guess. Now they're all sort of predictable, but um, her, she, we come home, she's making dinner. She's the one who's tracking the alcohol use at the party. I liked the idea of her sort of drawing on the, the cloth table, t- fabric tablecloth with her fork, making marks about, tick marks about each uh, drink that, that uh, Al takes in while he's on stage. Uh, all of that stuff I thought was, was really useful for her to do as a, as a loving wife, a caring wife. Yeah. But she's the one who kept the family going for her soldier while the war was going on, right? The family came back intact. This is in contrast to Fred's wife, uh, Virginia Mayo, uh, plays Marie Derry. She did not hold herself together. She made choices. Yeah, we kind of first get that sense when he goes back to see his dad, because apparently she had been living with his dad. And I, I assuming it was his stepmom, the way that he always kind of yeah, uh, approached her. Yeah. Uh, but you know, right out of the gate, they're like, oh, well, you know, she moved out a little while ago. She kind of it wasn't working out. And yeah, so she's working at a nightclub and is not the sort of person who um, really kind of welcomes what he's become into her life. Like she fell in love with the guy in the uniform. And that was her big thing. Like put your uniform on and when we go out tonight, because I want everybody to see you. Like she wants that image of him. And the fact that the reality is he's kind of a schlub working at the soda fountain. She's really disappointed with what her life has become, which of course leads her to kind of end up divorcing him after, after a time. Interesting story. Because she was the 1946 influencer, right? Like you can tell she <laughs> yeah. would have had a massive Insta had she been had she been tooling around today, don't you think? I, I love the scene when Peggy calls and invites uh, Marie and Fred to join her and this guy that she's kind of toying dating with. They go to this club, which was the most insane club I've ever seen. Like the dance floor is so small and it's so jam packed that it's like sardines like that. It was so funny watching them trying to dance and like getting yeah, that guy like getting elbowed in the face. Dancing. Yeah, they're just like <laughs> kind of bobbing up and down because that's all you can really do. But Marie is the one who goes over to the photographer lady and says, we're going to be needing photos over at that table in just a few minutes. And then, you know, they make sure that she poses perfectly for it. You know, we got to look like we're talking, you know, like that whole thing. And then she's like, we need four copies. Like it was so yeah. perfect. I'm like, wow, this, yeah, you're absolutely right. Total influencer of the day. Yeah, I thought it was great. And, and you know, from a filmmaking perspective, isn't it interesting that that's the the angle? They go to a big ballroom type restaurant and the movie does not offer us lingering awesome musical numbers like there's no like focus on the band there's no focus on how talented the vets are coming back from the war and dancing with their ladies like there's none of that sort of dance showcase that we sometimes get in these movies you know and i thought that was really interesting it makes it look like the least fun place to go right everybody's <laughs> there and that's the last place you actually want to be that's how I took took that scene. It was funny. We got quite the uh, views of various clubs at the time. Like at the beginning, we see all those different clubs that they're kind of going to. My favorite was just the one where it's the three faces and their noses are pressed up against the glass, just like yeah, watching the people <laughs> dancing inside. It's like, what a funny way to kind of portray uh, presumably for him, kind of the way that things have kind of shifted from the time he left to the way things are now. It was fun. So interesting. Uh, and then we get to Peggy, uh, Teresa Wright, with, and, and she is actually Al's daughter. That's the bit of familial consternation that we get because Al knows Fred is troubled as a vet. Like, that, he sees himself in Fred. That's what I get out of that. And, and says, I don't, want, I don't want you for my daughter. She needs someone who's, you know, a little bit more grounded than you are, buddy. Stay away. Well, not only that, it was just like that whole idea of divorce too, which kind of right. comes up like he is a married man, like that conversation that her parents have with her when she's like, I'm going to wreck their marriage. And they're like, uh. he is married. You know, what are you thinking? Like, I, I found that to be a, a delightful conversation. And that, you know, I mean, it still is fitting for this day. It's like they're they're a couple already. Think about decisions you're making before you go down this road. 
Exactly. And, and yet, that's the one that I think, from uh, the story perspective, we're supposed to feel most strongly about immediately. First, it's forbidden love, and it ends as kind of forbidden love on one of these fantastic dual subject shots, right? We get the, the sort of coda of the film is, um, you know, we're at the, the wedding of uh, Homer and Wilma, and they get we get the whole wedding, a very sort of abbreviated ceremony, but we have that cheering moment, like I was cheering when he put the ring on her finger with his hook. That was so great. I, I, that was, I was very much a hook enthusiast at that point. And then they kiss, and while everybody's cheering the, the bride and groom, we get this shot off the side where Peggy's standing in the background, and she's not moving at all. And Fred goes to her and kisses her standing in the background, and it's like, oh, this is what romance is. Are you kidding me? Blood boiling. It was so awesome and I loved it. And it was another little, it, it's another way to give the movie a chance to end on hope, even though we know Al was probably right and Fred is probably damaged. And who knows down the road if they are going to have a relationship that lasts, it lasts right now forever in that scene in the movie. I thought it was awesome. Yeah. And I, I um, think that the the key thing that we end up finding with with these relationships um you know and just as a quick side note we didn't mention kathy o'donnell who plays wilma that's the the girl who is is true to homer and she is a wonderful wonderful performer pretty straightforward role but she was great in it but i i want to uh kind of use this conversation that you were just talking about like or that the wedding scene as a transition to just the way that William Wyler constructed this film uh, with Greg Toland and the way that they used deep focus in a, a number of prominent scenes and camera work and just the way that that everything is constructed because I just was mesmerized with this film and that scene in particular really tied in actually beautifully with the the chopstick scene when you have Homer and Butch playing chopsticks and they invite Al to kind of watch them. And this is right after Al and Fred had just had that confrontation about him being in love with Peggy. And Fred kind of marches off and says, fine, I'm going to tell her right now and you won't have to worry about me ever again. And while Al is kind of watching what's going on, because we see Fred walk to the the back of the the, the room and he goes into this phone booth to make this call to Peggy. That's when Homer, who has no idea what's going on, um, he does this whole chopsticks routine. And you have the foreground action of everything going on at the piano with Al continuing to look backward, uh, back and forth between these two things because he's looking at Fred on the phone that is is perfectly illuminated just way in the back, like just that deep focus. It was perfect. Same thing at the wedding when you when you have Fred in the foreground as Homer's best man and Peggy kind of in the back with her family and then he keeps kind of looking at her and then as everybody comes to greet the new married couple, she stays there and you have that fantastic deep focus as he then goes back to her. It's just like those sorts of scenes, the way that Weiler chose to construct them and give space to the story. I mean, it just was magical. And it gives us a chance to see, like, anytime we get to triangulate these three guys, it's sort of an exploration to me of of friendship it, through trauma. Like, they meet on this plane uh, together in the very beginning of the movie. They did not really know each other before. They just sort of happened to be on the plane together. But they they become friends. They become entangled. And the story we get to the to the last beats, it's a neat celebration of how our lives can become entangled through trauma. That itself was a pretty special message. Two other uh, moments with the camera that I, I just wanted to call out because they were uh, just stunning. When Marie and Peggy go to the, the ladies' room to powder their noses while they're at that club. It is a fantastic single shot in mirrors, and it starts on kind of a two-shot, and you think you're just looking at them, and then the camera pans over, and you realize, oh, no, here they are. We're now behind them looking at their faces 
uh, in the mirror as they kind of continue the conversation. It's all about relationships and why Marie thinks that uh, Peggy is, you know, such a lucky girl for na- for nabbing this guy, Woody, whose family owns half of the town, all this sort of stuff. And it's kind of a conversation about relationships and love and what a relationship is and all that. And it, it was just interesting to see the, the dynamics of it flow, because then the camera pans again, just giving us a single of Peggy with her own reflection. So now it's just her and herself. And then we kind of come back to the the two shot, but it's it's shifted a little bit to really still focus on Peggy, just like fantastic single uh, single shot that just um, was really kind of just an astonishing bit of uh, film structure to make that work. Well, film structure, and it's just the icing on the cake of two really fun performances from these two women who are so opposite in in their identity, ideology, and their portrayal. I mean, it just really, everything worked in that sequence. And mirrors, man, hide the camera. Oof, yeah, what a fun right? challenge. Uh, and then the last one that I wanted to call out is when Fred, he's kind of given up on everything and he's going to leave town. And you see him in the um, airplane graveyard and he's just kind of walking through and he kind of this is it's a really interesting way. I suppose it's the era, the era's version of how you get through your PTSD as he hops out of the plane. He's just like, oh, I just, you know, getting rid of old demons or whatever. Yep. <laughs> just like, well, I think it's a little more work than that. But OK, at least they're trying here. But the way that the camera played as he was sitting in that old uh, kind of the bomb window of that old plane especially the trucking shot that we had from the ground coming up under it. And you have the sounds of the propellers and everything as if he's in battle. And you just kind of see him through that like really dirty window. And it's just kind of like this shadow of him through there. And just like, ah, just fantastic, dark, silhouette camera work. Just, I mean, it was a really powerful scene the way that they chose to you know put that together. So I love that particular part of the sequence. I think the entire sequence of him walking the graveyard is is really powerful. And I and I think and I know, you know, we talked recently about just sort of, you know, the experience of watching a movie is is both the movie and what you bring to it. But it, it's hard for me not to watch that movie, watch that sequence and watch him wandering through that massive, massive graveyard right? The, that's not a set, right? <laughs> like that was very clearly, you know, the, the ruins of old, old planes and engines and props and all of those, those pieces of the war machine that we threw at the war. And now what are they, right? That is, that to me is a central question of, of his experience there. Look at what we, look at what we came together and accomplished for war that is now garbage, right? It's now, it's now junk, and that becomes his future. He becomes a junk man. So his arc goes from building and being a part of the war machine to demolishing it. And I, I think that that makes this movie's sort of perspective on the war really compelling, because ostensibly it's about three heroes coming back from war and reintegrating. And what the movie really says to me is, you know what, the war is hard on everybody, economy, everybody is is hurt by the war. And maybe this is a movie that that intends for us to rethink our our experience in the fight itself. And it it also is the first of many films that go to um, explore soldiers return from war as forgotten citizens. Right. Like every war has them. The World War One, World War Two, Korea, Vietnam, like Desert Storm, like go through the wars, and we have this challenge of 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 how to reintegrate our soldiers, and and this movie I think is is really pushing pretty hard on those buttons, given 1940 sensibilities. Well, and I just think without this film, all of these other films that you know, wouldn't have had the stage set as well. You know, I mean, there have been so many interesting films since this point that really deal with returning from war and how you survive that and how you kind of relearn how to live and navigate life. And and sometimes it's it's successful. Sometimes it's tragic. Sometimes the person can't let go, as we see in The Hurt Locker, and he, he can't even go to the grocery store with Evangeline Lilly. He has to go back to war. And it's like, 
the way that it really kind of um, rewires your brain, and uh, just I, I think that it was it was captured exceptionally well here. Just a uh, yeah, very very uh, strong example, and again, doing a great job as you were just saying of giving us the kind of the hope, but also showing us so many of those darker elements that um, I think people's eyes were starting to open to. So one of my pet peeves, uh, ongoing pet peeves, is using the title of the film in the movie. This one does it. I am curious uh, on that point what you think of the title of the film, given everything we're talking about, about the film's perspective, what are the best years of our lives? It feels to me like a subversive dig by the end of this movie, where at the beginning of this movie, it really could be a lovely 1940s love story. Yeah, that's actually an interesting conversation to have because, uh, you know, what are they saying the best years of our lives are? Is it rebuilding our lives post-war? Like, now that the war is over, we have survived it and we're coming out stronger on the back end? Is it a little bit of an ironic name because, you know, so much has changed and the best years of our lives may have been over and now we're like having to figure out what is uh, the best part of our life now. You know, it's it's an interesting, uh, I don't know, it's an interesting title in the way that they put all that together. So did that, wait, who said it in the movie? I'm trying to think about that now. Uh, Marie. Oh, but she says, I gave up the best years of my life. Yeah. Does that count then? I think that you're being a little... I, it counts enough. I so the the thing that I <laughs> the thing that I got to thinking about it though was this for Frederick March for for Al Stevenson the best years of his life may have been perceived as the twenty years leading up to the war. Right, he built a family in those twenty years. For uh, uh, you know our man Harold Russell uh, for Wilma and um, you know those two I can't Homer. There's is absolutely ahead. Right. Like it, it ends on such a high note for the two of them getting married and starting a new life together that has been impending all their lives from when they were kids. Like they've loved each other all along. And now the best years of their lives arguably are to come. And for Fred, Fred's is the most interesting because he is the one that we get to see most actively trying to get to to uh, resolve his feelings of the war. That was when he was arguably most useful when he was dropping bombs, when he was most effective, certainly not most effective as a soda jerk or selling perfume that he doesn't understand before or after the war. And for Marie, the best years of her life were arguably when he was gone. So we get the three <laughs> chapters that each represent the best years of our lives were represented differently for each of these men. And I think that's an interesting uh, way to frame the title in and around the experiences of these intertwined stories. Yeah, that's uh, it, it is really interesting because there is a lot of ways that you can look at that. And, you know, inevitably, I suppose, even Al. You could argue that however we read where the story goes, to a certain extent, he stood up to his boss. He's acknowledged these changes in his family and his life hasn't fallen apart. Like they're all still together. He didn't divorce Millie or anything like that. Like he's they're going to have a successful relationship moving forward. It's entirely possible that even his life, like moving forward. And I think that's the interesting thing about a title like The Best Years of Our Lives. And just even saying that, it's like perpetually, it's always going to be shifting, however, whatever it is that you're thinking about. And that's it, it makes for a really interesting read for a for a film like this. Yeah, for sure. Um, we we talked about William Wyler in just our very last uh, series uh, with Wuthering Heights. Aside from kind of like the the camera work and everything, did you notice anything in here that really made you go, uh, this William Wyler, I enjoy what he does? Like all of it, like I mean, we've already sort of talked about my favorite sequences, obviously the deep focus or the, the, the deep focus techniques and the, but, but for me, the transition between, you know, set pieces around California to the, sh to the, the airship graveyard uh, and the way we transition to how the camera is moving, tracking parallel along the, the graveyard itself, I thought was extraordinary. And so all of those pieces I felt were, were, just really demonstrated how confident William Wyler is um, as a director. 
the coming to this story was kind of interesting because I, I guess when Samuel Goldwyn, he originally read an article in Time magazine, August 7th, 1944, which was an interesting little article, uh, you know, I had tracked it down. It's following several veterans as they're all going back to their homes. And you're just kind of getting a sense of the perspective of like the nerves, the how nervous they are and everything. And and it really kind of gave an interesting perspective on a veteran coming home, which we get at the beginning, right out of the gate when Homer's like, hey, uh, you know, how about we just go out for a drink instead? And like, he's afraid to go inside. He read that article And then he hired a war correspondent, McKinley Cantor, to come on board and write the script. Cantor wrote a novella, actually, called Glory for Me, written in blank verse. And I guess what Goldwyn did, I don't know what happened with Cantor, but I guess he brought in Robert Sherwood to adapt that novella as the screenplay. And I guess there, you know, over time, there had been some disappointment on the part of Cantor as far as, you know, his his story here and how he felt that he didn't really get, uh, like, they didn't even mention, like, what his book had been titled or anything. It's, it's an interesting, um, like, they didn't call it, uh, you know, the same thing. They changed the title of it, as we were just talking about, to the best years of our lives. But it had been called Glory for Me, and he was... Uh, pretty disappointed that they changed the title. They changed the story. um, And uh, I guess he walked off of the set um, or walked off of the the lot um, after talking to Samuel Goldwyn about it because of how he felt so dismissed by the whole thing. So I don't know how much more drama there was about that, but it seems... I don't know. I, I, I tried to find glory for me so that I could look at it and see kind of, you know, in the scope of this series, talking about adapting and everything, I would like to have seen what this blank verse novella looked like to kind of lead to this. But um, I, I'm just mighty impressed with this screenplay overall. I really would love to see what Cantor came up with to uh, to get to this point. Yeah, me too. Fascinating. I, it, it's yeah, I mean, it's this is one of those movies that's interesting because it makes me like I so enjoy my experience with the movie that my introspection and curiosity is just that not that sort of ving- that little bit of vindictive piece that I think maybe I should read what they came up with, because that would have been somehow better than what I got. What we got here was an exemplary film and, a, and an exemplary script for me. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, we will be right back. But first, our credits. The Next Reel is a production of True Story FM, engineering by Andy Nelson, music by Piotr Hummel, Oriel Novella, and Eli Catlin. Andy usually finds all the stats for the awards and numbers at d-numbers.com, boxofficemojo.com, imdb.com, and wikipedia.org. Find the show at truestory.fm, and if your podcast app allows ratings and reviews, please consider doing that for our show. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to support our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Hemp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe. We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring 
a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films, head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. All right, Andy, uh, sequels and remakes. It's sequels and remakes time. This uh, had been adapted a few times via radio, uh, 1947 and then 1949. Four sef- separate half-hour adaptations. One was from Hedda Hopper's This Is Hollywood, two from the Screen Guild Theater, and one from the Screen Director's Playhouse. Some of these actors came back to reprise their roles uh, that they had played in the film, but I have not been able to find, I'm assuming they were kind of adapted from the script and from the film itself, not another version of the adaptation from Cantor's novella. But um, yeah, I, this was that era. Radio adaptations uh, were all the podcast rage of the day. So we just watched a nearly three-hour movie, and you're saying they did four half-hour, half-hour radio adaptations. <laughs> I cannot imagine what is cut to make those still feel like a complete story. Yeah, I would be I would uh, be curious to hear what they sounded like. Uh, this one did uh, apparently fairly well in award season, Andy. Fairly well indeed. Fairly well indeed. Uh, this film had 21 wins with three other nominations. You know, that is a fantastic uh, <laughs> uh, rate of win that they had, you know. Uh, almost That's how they 90. measure success is the rate of awards as yeah, they're given. Almost rate 90% per, rate. of their nominations <laughs> did they win. Yeah, And they, also awards per minute on awards night. That's, that's, <laughs> that's also right. how they do it. A, a, a PM. <laughs> that's right. Uh, the Oscars, of course, was the big one. That is what we're talking about for this particular series. Best Writing Screenplay, which it did win. It also won Best Motion Picture, Best Director, Best Actor for Frederick March, Best Supporting Actor for Harold Russell, Best Film Editing, Best Scoring of a Dramatic or Comedy Picture. And then Harold Russell won an Academy Honorary Award. And you had mentioned that it was for bringing hope and courage to his fellow veterans through his appearance. And then Samuel Goldwyn won the Irving G. Thalberg Memorial Award for this. Now, it was a big curiosity, uh, and it is still earmarked as uh, and an only time, because this is the only film that to have an actor receive two Academy Awards for the same performance. It's an interesting story because Harold Russell was nominated for Best Supporting Actor opposite Charles Coburn in The Green Years, Claude Rains in Notorious, which we've talked about on the show, Clifton Webb in The Razor's Edge, and William Demarest in The Jolson Story. The uh, Academy... <laughs> really didn't think Harold Russell was going to win. They were like, uh, the, the, there's no way a non-actor is going to beat any of those other four fine actors for this award. Because it's such an important performance, let's give him an honorary award. And then he went on to win Best Supporting Actor and get this honorary Oscar. So uh, quite a twist. And yes, he did sell his Best Supporting Actor. He always kept his honorary Oscar. but. Uh, Anyway, that is the Oscars. Now, over at the BAFTAs, it won Best Film from Any Source. At the Karlavi Vari International Film Festival, this is in the Czech Republic. It's actually one of the uh, oldest in the world and has become Central and Eastern European's leading film event. I, You know, because it won so many awards, I looked at where did it lose? It won Best Director, it won Best Screenplay, but it lost Best the Crystal Globe for Best Film to the film The Last Stage out of 22 other nominated films. And at the New York Film Critics Circle Awards, it won Best Film and Best Director, but Frederick March lost Best Actor to Laurence Olivier in Henry V. You know, losing to Olivier, (laughs) it's not the worst guy to lose to. It's not. It really isn't. And, you know, Frederick March, he just had his terrible awards. All right. Well, uh, given all of its success, I have to assume you've had some better luck at the box office. Well, you know, Best Picture winner, 
finally getting some good details. Uh, for this film, Weiler had a budget of $2.1 million, or $34.2 million in today's dollars. The movie opened November 21st, 1946, and went on to earn $23.65 million, or three hundred eighty. million. $5.7 million in today's dollars. I couldn't find any international figures, but with just this information, it already has earned an adjusted profit per finished minute of almost $2 million. Well, that's that's fascinating. The, the other thing that I found fascinating is that, uh, reportedly, Russell made ten grand on his performance, right? And no residuals at all. That is controversial in the land of acting and performing right and and pay but that's a, like 170 grand in today's dollars not a bad payday for a non-actor to come into and, and do a single movie and have, i bet he was paid more for this than he was for his military short in other words <laughs> well yeah it's i mean that is an interesting thing for sure but yeah when you are winning oscars and everything i guess uh you know it's, it's tricky because when you're working with uh when you're a first-time actor even in a union it's not like you have any room for negotiation yeah right right you don't you don't have a say okay well it's fascinating i i think it was just it was it's an extraordinary film and it was a delight to watch and i'm really Really glad that we have it on the list. This is a film I need to remember to put on my list more often because it's just, I mean, it's just a powerful, powerful story. So touching. Just Again, I'm just totally taken by how Greg Toland and William Wyler chose to construct it. Just an absolutely, absolutely beautiful film. Yeah, me too. We'll be right back for our ratings. But first, here's the trailer for next week's movie, David Lean's Brief Encounter. I'm a happily married woman. Or rather, I was until a few weeks ago. This is my whole world. And it's enough. Or rather, it was until a few weeks ago. Can I help you? Uh, oh, no, please, it's only something in my eye. Try pulling your eyelid down as far as it'll go. And then blowing your nose. Please let me look. I happen to be a doctor. That's very kind of you. Oh, turn around to light, please. That's how it all began. Just through me getting a little piece of grit in my eye. Are you going to pictures this afternoon? Yes. How extraordinary, so am I. I thought you had to be all day at the hospital. Well, between ourselves, I killed two patients by accident this morning, and the matron is very displeased with me. I, I simply don't go back. But you like your wife. Madeline? Small, dark, rather delicate. How funny, I just thought she would have been fair. And your husband, what's he like? Medium height, brown hair, kindly. Unemotional, but not delicate at all. We're neither of us free to love each other. There's too much in the way. There's too time. If we control ourselves and behave like sensible human beings, there's too time. I'm an ordinary woman. I didn't think such violent things could happen to ordinary people. Give us a kiss. Well, oh, do no such thing. The lady might see us. Come on, a quick one across the bar. Albert, stop it. Come on, there's a lot. Let go of me this minute. There's a lot. Albert! Now look at me, Banbury's all over the floor. I want you to promise me something. What is it? Promise me that however unhappy you are, and however much you think things over, that you meet me again next Thursday. Where? Outside the hospital, 12.30. All right, I promise. It is hard to believe we've been having in-depth weekly conversations about movies since 2011. You're telling me producing this show week after week is so much fun, but it does require a lot of work behind the scenes. If you'd like to help support our efforts, one easy way is by using our Originals page when shopping for books and movies that we've covered. Your purchases made through our links give us a small commission at no extra cost to you and allow us to keep having these great discussions. 
the originals page at thenextreel.com slash originals. Links to the source material for all of our adapted film discussions. Purchasing through our links supports the show. In season 13, we explore various awards categories and the films nominated in them. We wrapped up our 1940 Best Picture series with adaptations of Mice and Men from John Steinbeck and Wuthering Heights from Emily Bronte's novel, not to mention the play Dark Victory by George Brewer Jr. and Bertram Block. The 1947 Academy Award adapted screenplay series featured Anna and the King of Siam based on Margaret Langdon's book, plus The Best Years of Our Lives, Brief Encounter, and The Killers. The 1952 cinematography nominees included Death of a Salesman and a Streetcar Named Desire, A Place in the Sun, based on both a play and a book, and Strangers on a Train, based on Patricia Highsmith's first novel. So many great movies based on books and plays, like Beckett, The Pumpkin Eater, A Boy and His Dog, Rollerball, The Princess Bride, Congo, The Scarlet Letter, Jackie Brown, The Deep End, The Gray, The Woman in Black, and Top Gun Maverick, which I'm very much looking forward to revisiting. Get the source books at thenextreel.com slash originals. Start your next read or reread from the movies we've covered. Visit thenextreel.com slash originals today. Letterboxd, Andy. It's time to do Letterboxd, and uh, we're going to see how many stars... <laughs> I don't know. Is it even a joke to make a joke about how we feel about this movie? I have a pretty strong feeling that you've robbed other movies for hearts for this one. <laughs> I, you know, I just uh, right out of the gate when we start seeing the people coming home to their families and stuff, I'm already tearing up. I'm like, oh, my God, this is going to be a hard one for me. It just it was so beautiful, like the way that the story was constructed. It's just absolutely a five star heart film. Definitely something that I will remember. Oh, God, no kidding. Absolutely. And uh, thrilled to have been able to watch it and give it five stars. Some future movie does not get some stars because this one gets all five. <laughs> well, don't forget, visit thenextreel.com slash letterboxd. You can get your patron or pro membership. It works for renewals as well. So what did you think about the best years of our lives? We would love to hear your thoughts. Hop into the Show Talk channel over in our Discord community, where we will be talking about the movie this week. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. Letterbox give it, Andrew. As Letterbox always doeth. I don't know why we did this this week the way we did it. A lot. Yeah, of why did we go low movie. on this one? <laughs> why did we go low on this one? This is just like muck. There's a lot of hate by this movie, but but I you know I do think that there is some interesting stuff going on at the bottom for the way this movie hits different uh, across generations because some of the folks who have reviewed um, are watching this movie today as assignments in class, indicating that they're in some sort of film studies class, they're watching this movie, and, um, and and they didn't love it like we did. There's other stuff that we're not reading that is just really, here's an excuse to practice trash talking and see how it hits, see if my jokes hit. That's what a lot of the reviews feel like to me at the bottom of this particular barrel. So I did go for a one star, and it's one of those that I was, was talking about. You also one star, less? Did you find something less? No, I just went with one star as well. All right. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and take the the honor of this one because it does include a bit of scripted material. Oh, good. Uh, professor, this movie is three hours long, but it's so good you won't notice the time passed. Me, so boring that I stayed on my phone waiting for the time to pass, running out of distractions. Technically impressive, though, uh, though I will give it that. I just cannot stand the runtime for this film. Slice of life films are incredibly not my thing, but to have one dragged out to three hours is insane. I literally dashed out the door when the film ended. I just could not care for this film since nothing really happens in it. And judging by the positive reviews all saying, oh, this may me reflect on life blah 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 it clearly was a film that either hit its mark or it for you on you or it did not and i just happen to be one of the people who it didn't hit i can't say that it's like i i can't dispute that like if it's a movie that's just too long for you if your attentional sort of spectrum is doesn't meet the three-hour movie i get it it's fine doesn't have to be you i do uh, i i guess i stand with your professor that and and perhaps with the wisdom of age and experience maybe you'll come back to it in another 20 or 30 years and and find a little bit of heart in it 
That's entirely possible. Clearly, there is some of that. Although this one from the the profile picture of Martin Stevens looks to be not far younger than us. But uh, so I don't know. But still, the best years of our lives was one of the worst three hours of mine. Slow and boring like an elderly tortoise and had me yawning for 90% of its duration. If if this film was a horse, I'd turn it into glue and dog food. Oh, wow. Yeah. Ooh, wow. That's rough. Uh, I mean, some people hate it. Some people just seem to really find it boring. I, I, you know, maybe it's just this type of story is just not for everybody. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, thanks, Letterboxd. 